Hello, my name is Austin Habish, the founder of Think Catholic, your source for Catholic thought with both depth and devotion, and I'd like to thank you for joining us. Joining me is Dr. Alan Femister as we continue our series on comparative religions. Today with special guest, Professor Roy Showman, on his journey from Judaism to the Catholic faith. But first, the Catholic thought on the topic. And speaking of the relationship between the Catholic Church and the sons of Jacob according to the flesh, the Second Vatican Council, in its decree on non-Christian religions, Nostra Aetate, states, As Holy Scripture testifies, Jerusalem did not recognize the time of her visitation, nor did the Jews in large number accept the gospel. Indeed, not a few opposed its spreading. Nevertheless, God holds the Jews most dear for the sake of their fathers. He does not repent of the gifts he makes or of the calls he issues. Such is the witness of the apostle. Since the spiritual patrimony common to Christians and Jews is thus so great, this sacred synod wants to foster and recommend that mutual understanding and respect which is the fruit, above all, of biblical and theological studies as well as of fraternal dialogues. And as a published expert in mutual understanding and theological dialogue between Judaism and the Catholic faith, as well as a convert from Judaism himself, Dr. Femister, would you like to introduce our guest? Certainly. It's a great honor to introduce uh, Roy Showman, who was uh, born and raised uh, Jewish by Jewish parents uh, just outside New York, who had fled Nazi Germany. Uh, Roy grew up uh, receiving a thoroughly Jewish education, followed by a Bachelor of Science degree from MIT and an MBA from Harvard Business School, where he then joined the faculty as Professor of Marketing. Well, a Jewish marketing professor, that is, a, <laughs> yes, at Harvard Business School, he received two supernatural experiences, one of Christ and one of the Blessed Virgin Mary, that resulted from his unanticipated, in his unanticipated and enthusiastic conversion to Catholicism. Now he writes, speaks and teaches on Catholic theology, focusing on the relationship between Judaism and the Catholic Church. He has written two best-selling books published by Ignatius Press, Salvation is from the Jews, the role of Judaism in salvation history, and Honey from the Rock, 16 Jews find the sweetness of Christ. He has taught theology at Ave Maria University and Holy Apostles College and Seminary, where I am proud to have him as my colleague. And he hosts a weekly Catholic radio show on Radio Maria, has a daily internet live stream, and appears frequently on EWTN television and radio shows. Um, Roy, thank you very much for uh, joining us. And I'm sorry I, I, I chuckled uh, halfway through that description of you. I, I just <laughs> thought I was, it sounded like you were a, a, a professor of marketing to Jews <laughs> when I read off the other question. So, yes, that's why I was amused. Hey, no, no problem. I was a <laughs> Jewish professor of marketing, not a professor <laughs> of Jewish marketing. Yeah. Or, um, on the contrary, Harvard Business School is used to paying retail, so <laughs> distinctly not Jewish marketing. But anyway, oh boy, great place to start, right, with an anti-Semitic comment. But anyway, oh, um, I'll just start with my witness testimony. I will say that was very interesting. I had a very interesting reaction to that uh, reading from Nostra Tata because it's a very complicated issue because, of course, the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable, as St. Paul said. But the greatest gift of God to the Jews and the greatest promise that God made to the Jews was to send the Messiah through them to basically completely revolutionize the, the relationship between God and man and to bring God infinitely closer to man than he had ever been before. And God was true to that promise, and he sent us Jesus. So to the extent that Jews do not recognize Jesus, and more particularly the sacraments of the Catholic Church. They are not fully participating in the gift and the promise that God gave to the Jews. Does that make sense? Yeah, well said, Roy. So anyway, so, um, uh, but I better start with my witness testimony before I get in any more additional trouble. But it's a very, very uh, kind of thorny thorny issue because you want to have, uh, I think a, a Catholic should have an infinite respect for um, the first half of salvation history, which came through the Jews 
and for the Jews' role in, in bringing us the Messiah. But that doesn't mean that there is nothing fundamentally defective about a contemporary interpretation of Judaism, which says that Jesus was not the Messiah, and the Messiah still has to come. So at the same time, there's, there's a profound need for a tremendously deep respect and reverence for Jews and Judaism, but you can't paper over the fact that in the rejection of Jesus, they are actually um, in a somewhat defective state. Okay, witness testimony, no more, no more on PC stuff. Okay, so <laughs> I was a, I, I, as, as uh, Professor Bimister said, my parents were both German Jewish Holocaust refugees. They both were born and raised in Germany and came over. My father early in Hitler's reign, my mother was less fortunate and um, she got caught up in the Holocaust somewhat more, but she managed to escape and make it to the United States where my parents met and married. My upbringing was entirely Jewish. The world we lived in was entirely Jewish. Uh, there was much less um, acceptance actually of Jews in those days uh, the town that my parents lived in outside of New York City was the only town in the area that actually allowed Jews to buy houses. So we were in a state of somewhat voluntary and somewhat enforced segregation from the non-Jewish world. And I went to Jewish religious education all the way from the beginning of school up until um, university alongside secular education. And then I went to MIT, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which was perhaps the foremost uh, engineering and science school in the country. And uh, I lost my faith in God there. I actually was uh, propagandized or catechized or whatever into thinking that uh, the belief in God was a kind of superstition that man had until he had science to tell him the real explanations of everything. Anyway, so under that pseudoscientific worldview, I uh, um, did not think actually in good conscience I could still believe in God, although on some level I kind of did, and I, I certainly wanted to, but I thought that it was kind of like a willing suspension of disbelief to believe in God, so I was essentially atheist when I got out. I went on to Harvard Business School um, uh, after a few years uh, working as a computer scientist, and uh, I did well enough there that I was invited back upon graduation to join the faculty. So I found myself a newly minted professor of marketing at Harvard Business School at the ripe old age of 29. And that's really when the bottom fell out of my world, which also means it's where my witness testimony really begins. Because all my life, I felt there has to be a real meaning and purpose to life. And someday when I'm older, I'll come into the real meaning and purpose of life which I thought would come from entering into a personal relationship with God, which I thought would happen by bar mitzvah, which is the religious ceremony when the uh, child is about 13. It's a little bit parallel to the confirmation in the Catholic Church. The child enters into religious adulthood in a ceremony in the synagogue. And I really thought that at my bar mitzvah, is when I would enter into a personal relationship with God, but when that didn't happen, it was actually one of the saddest days of my childhood. But then I pretty soon decided the real meaning and purpose of life would come when I got a driver's license yes. or when I left home, or um, if I got, first if I got into MIT, then if I got into Harvard Business School, then I would find the meaning of life in my career or whatever. But at this point in my life as a professor at Harvard, um, I was already more successful in a worldly sense than I had ever expected to be, but life still had no meaning or purpose, right? We're just the result of a bolt of lightning that hit a puddle of amino acids five billion years ago, and eventually we crawled out and we live for 80 or 90 years and die, and there's no meaning or purpose to anything, and things just happen, and, and uh, you know, when we die, we're dead, and that's it, and nothing made any sense, and there was nothing to look forward to or hope at that point, and there was nothing more I could expect in terms of my, um, you know, worldly life or career that would actually give my life meaning if being a professor at Harvard didn't. And so I fell into the deepest despair of my life at that point. And in that despair, 
I was walking in nature early one morning in a beautiful spot, um, kind of in between. It was uh, an area of the National Seashore, actually, on Cape Cod. And I was kind of in between the sand dunes and in the little pine forest behind the sand dunes. And I um, had long since lost any hope in believing in God when I received the most spectacular grace of my life from one moment to the next. I was just walking along lost in my thoughts when the uh, veil between the spiritual world and the physical world disappeared. And I saw myself or I found myself seeing into the spiritual world, which was pretty amazing in itself, but much more powerful was the fact that I found myself in the immediate, immediate uh, presence of God in a very deep state of communion and communication with God, a kind of mind meld, so to speak. And um, I uh, certainly experienced very directly uh, my relationship to God and God's love for me. But I, it was as though I had uh, died and was looking back over my life in the presence of God seeing everything and understanding everything as I would after I died, looking back over my life in the presence of God. And um, in this experience, um, I received a tremendous amount of um, theological truths, I guess you could say, um, that were just shown to me. Now, Catholics know about them in principle. I didn't even know about them in principle as a Jew, but I saw that we live forever. I saw that every action has a moral content that is observed and recorded for all eternity, that every time we do something that has value in the eyes of heaven, we will literally be rewarded for it for all eternity. I saw that every opportunity we let by and don't take advantage of will be a lost opportunity for all eternity. I saw that absolutely everything that ever happened to me in my whole life, including those things that have caused the most suffering, in fact, especially those things that have caused the most suffering, have been the most perfect thing that could be arranged coming from the hand of an all-knowing, all-loving God for my own good. And the uh, most overwhelming aspect of this experience was uh, directly experiencing that God himself, the God who not only created everything that exists, but created existence itself, or for those philosophers listening who created contingent existence itself. <laughs> My wife is a philosopher, so she corrects me about that. But essentially created existence itself, not only knew me by name, not only had been watching over me every moment of my existence, not only had been arranging everything to be the most perfect thing that could possibly be arranged for me every moment of my existence, but had been caring about me, obsessing about me, um, paying attention to me, absorbed by me, as though I were the only creature he had ever created, and as though, in a very real sense, everything that made me happy made him happy, and everything that made me sad made him sad. And it was coming into that experience or realization that transformed everything. I understood there's never any reason to be anxious about anything. I saw that one of my greatest regrets when I died would be all of the time and energy I had wasted worrying about not being loved when every moment of my existence I was held in a notion of love greater than I ever imagined could exist, coming from this all-knowing, all-loving God. And, um, you know, there was never any reason to be anxious about anything. And there was never any, certainly never any reason to, you know, feel unloved, so to speak, or unnoticed or whatever it is. So um, I definitely was happier than I had ever been. And I went back home happier than I had ever been. I knew that the meaning and purpose of my life was to worship and serve my Lord and Master and God who was revealing himself to me. Now, during this experience, you know, back during, in the middle of this experience, I, of course, knew in the context of this experience that the meaning and purpose of my life was to worship and serve my Lord and Master and God who was revealing himself to me, but I didn't know what religion this was. I didn't know what God this was. I didn't know what religion to follow. And uh, I couldn't think of this as Judaism and the God of Judaism. I know it was, and I'm happy to talk about that if you're interested, but the uh, truth is that the picture of God that emerges from the Old Testament is of a God far more distant 
from ordinary humanity than this God was, and far more judgmental. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, God makes it clear, it's explicit, that he does not reveal himself to ordinary people, but only to the uh, patriarchs, patriarchs and prophets. And even King David, when he wanted to find out what he had done wrong, had to go to the prophet Nathan and say, find out from the Lord what I did wrong and what I'm being punished for and so forth. So it never occurred to me that the God of Judaism would have this kind of intimate relationship with me. Now I know that, of course, it was the God of Judaism, but I also know something else, which is that the entire relationship between divinity and humanity was transformed by the incarnation of the second person of the Most Holy Trinity as a man. That was the whole point of it. So it's not that the Jews had it wrong. It's that God did not have the intimacy with humanity before the coming of Christ, and most particularly before the ascension of Christ and the, the full incorporation of the human nature into the divine nature that he has now. That's all a digression. I'm happy to go back and talk about that if you wish. But anyway, so I prayed, let me know your name so I know what religion to follow. I don't mind if you're Buddha and I have to become Buddhist. I don't mind if you're uh, Krishna and I have to become Hindu. I don't mind if you're Apollo and I have to become a Roman pagan. As long as you're not Christ and I have to become Christian. And he respected that prayer. He did not reveal his name to me. Um, but I went back home happier than I had ever been. As I said, I knew there was never any reason to be anxious about anything. I knew that we live forever. I knew that every moment has this infinite depth of meaning because if nothing else, we can do something of value in the eyes of heaven for which we will be rewarded for all eternity. I know that was a selfish perspective, but Jesus himself in the gospel says, the children of this world are wiser in their pursuits than the children of light are in theirs. So if you're going to be selfish, you might as well be selfish for the right things, which is, which is our state of, uh, for all eternity in heaven. So that was my mindset when I went back home. But anyway, all I wanted to do was know who this God was and what religion to follow, to worship and serve him properly and please him and so forth. But um, I didn't know who he was, and I uh, went on some false paths. This has been a mystical experience, and so I looked into mystical experiences and so forth. But I did one smart thing, which is every night before going to sleep, I would say a short prayer I had made up to know the name of my Lord and God and Master who had revealed himself to me in this experience. And a year to the day after that first experience, I went to sleep. I thought I was woken by a hand gently on my shoulder and led to a room and left alone with the most beautiful young woman I could ever imagine. And I knew without being told it was the Blessed Virgin Mary. And um, the first thing she said to me was she offered to answer any questions I might have for her. So I asked her six or seven questions, which she graciously answered. And then she spoke to me a little longer. And eventually the interview was over and I went back to sleep. I'll, make a comment about that in a, in a moment. I now understand that this experience took place while my body was asleep in bed, but I thought I was awake and I felt as though I was awake and my memory represents as though I was awake. And I not only remember things word for word, but I actually remember the things I didn't say out loud, you know, thinking about what about this question? That's silly. Okay. I'll ask that question and so forth. So subjectively it was felt like a waking experience, even though now I know that it wasn't in the literal sense. But anyway, when I woke up the next morning, I knew it had been Christ in the first experience, and I knew who the Blessed Virgin Mary was. I really knew who she was. I, I, I had seen in this experience how she was the conduit through which all of the graces that flow from divinity into humanity flow. And so when I woke up the next morning, I knew I wanted to be as fully and completely a Christian as possible. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know the difference between a Protestant and a Catholic. But I knew who the Blessed Virgin Mary was, so that led me fairly directly into the Catholic Church. So I am going to take a breath here and momentarily stop. Usually usually when I give my witness testimony, you know, maybe I'm on stage with a microphone and I just have to talk nonstop for however long it is. But I have the great privilege today of having some listeners on the other end of the microphone, so to speak, who um, are at least as insightful and intelligent as me. So I will simply invite them to ask any questions they have at this point before I 
continue in my um, machine gun fashions. Uh, what an incredible witness, Roy. I, I could only imagine those people hearing this right now, just what is going through their minds. The first question I would like to ask you, Roy, is you make the comment on the beach, God, let me know your name provided it's not Christ, not Jesus. Can I ask what led you to, to, to make that statement? Um, if I can be a little bit pedantic, it's not exactly what I said. What I said is I don't mind if you're Buddha. I don't mind if you're Krishna. I don't mind if you're Apollo, as long as you're not Christ. So I didn't actually ask him not to tell me his name, but I did let him know that I certainly didn't want to hear it. So, um, but anyway, um, the, okay, growing up Jewish in the aftermath of the Holocaust and both my parents being Holocaust refugees, um, it's, it's, a, it's quite a complicated backdrop that I have to paint. I had nothing against Christians. I had nothing against Catholics. Um, the one fellow MIT student who I really chose to be my roommate and really wanted to be my roommate was a was a observant Catholic young man. So I, I had nothing against Christians, but I had something huge against Christianities and against Jesus. My understanding at the time was that Jesus was a false messiah. Basically, any Jew has to either think Jesus was, well, I shouldn't say any Jew, but any, any conventional Jew who rejects Christianity has to think that Jesus was a false messiah or that he didn't live at all. Those are the only choices. So I thought that Jesus is false messiah, that his followers came up with this religion of Christianity, and that as a result of Christianity, the Jews have been persecuted for the last 2,000 years and have undergone a tremendous amount of suffering, which only came about because of the role of Jews in Judaism in this false messianic heresy off of Judaism called Christianity. So Jesus was kind of public enemy number one. Jesus was the cause, Jesus pretending to be the Messiah was the cause of 2,000 years of suffering of the Jews. So needless to say, I had some um, reservations about embracing Jesus. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Femister. Um, <clears throat> I would mind if I ask two completely unrelated questions. One is... Um, one is just a sort of silly technical question. I, I'm sort of interested in why you, why you're so convinced that you remained asleep in bed, given all of those uh, details you you mentioned about thinking about what to say and 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 then not saying some of the things you thought about saying. And um, and the the other question is not so technical or silly. I hope, uh, which is. Um, uh, so I was interested from the perspective of Judaism, where, how Christianity itself, and in a way how Islam is explained, in that, I mean, it seems like a an enormous, an enormous thing that a, a billion people of Muslims should think that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, even though they're wrong about lots and lots of other things, and. Um, and that you know, two billion people should believe that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah and that He's God in the form of all the Catholics and the Protestants in the world. Um, and and one would think that such, even if of course they're wrong, uh, it would seem that that's an enormous event in in salvation history that the prophets would so, talk about. I I, I I want to cut you off only because I have yeah. the memory. Uh, and the memory which qualifies me to be president of the United States, if you know what I mean. Okay. So I, by the time I answer the first question, I'll have forgotten your second question. <laughs> okay, so, cool. um, allow me to, uh, you know, and I want to do justice to both questions. Great. Um, it's very kind of you to ask how I'm convinced that it was a, um, my, it was an out-of-body experience or my body was asleep in bed or whatever. Um, because, first of all, for the first year, I think I would have wanted to punch somebody who suggested that. It never occurred to me. I mean, it, it was so, so much awakening experience. However, um, having now, you know, kind of exposed myself to a lot of 
Catholic theology and so forth. And even even St. Paul says, you know, you know, taken up into the third heaven, whether awake or asleep, I don't know, or something like that. Um, it's much, I, I think it's much more prudent to assume that my body was asleep in bed. And some of what I saw in that experience were supernatural truths. But that doesn't mean I necessarily had to be asleep to see them. I know that the Fatima children, for instance, who are completely awake and, you know, they saw hell and so forth. But um, I'm, uh, it's just much more prudent, and uh, I, I certainly don't want to bet my salvation on the fact that I was awake at the time or that it was a physical experience. Um, and, uh, you know, people have asked me, do you have your bishop's, you know, approbation of this, of this uh, apparition, to which I can say I don't think the church has to give you know, official approval of dreams, if you know what I mean. So it just seems yeah. like a much more prudent and safer and probably correct uh, interpretation of what happened. Yeah, I and, and uh, I have no evidence to uh, accept my subjective experience. And even that, once that subjective experience gets heavily supernatural, for instance, like the way I saw that the Blessed Virgin Mary was the conduit between divinity and humanity, you know, it's uh, there, there, there are more things in heaven and earth than whatever you know the human mind is aware of. Uh, things get very complicated when you're at this intersection between uh, the spiritual world and the physical world. And I don't think it's 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 prudent to uh, kind of come down too hard on on the side of it being uh, physical. Um, the other question. I, I, I think I can answer. I'll, I'll give it a shot, and you can let me know if I'm not hitting it on target. Jews are not stupid by and large. They are aware that, okay, I, I'm going to leave aside Muslims because actually it's another conversation, but I would, I, I would have to be convinced that Islam teaches that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. They simply teach that he was a great prophet second to Muhammad. Um, if you were to tell me that you know for a fact that uh, Islam or the Quran names Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, I would stand happily corrected. My current understanding is that the Quran uh, and Muhammad simply says that Jesus was the greatest of prophets until Muhammad. I was under the impression that, that they claimed that Isa is the Messiah, but, I, but I'm not okay. a scholar of Islam by any stretch Absolutely of the imagination. Fine. Okay, I, in other words, I have a lot to learn, including that, apparently. Um, the, the Jewish understanding of why, so here's the problem. The problem is, clearly, I, and I do want to leave Muslims aside for the moment. I think there's some com confusing issues there. But Jews are certainly aware that there are 2 billion Christians in the world. And if you have this false Messiah who ends up getting 2 billion followers in the world, it has to be part of divine providence and has to be part of God's plan. So the question they're faced with is, in what way is this part of God's plan? And their answer is the following, which is Judaism is by nature restricted to Jews. If you want to restrict a religion, a good way to do it is to require a circumcision of, <laughs> of converts, right? It's hardly a, much of a selling point. So Judaism was always intended essentially for the offspring of Abraham through Isaac. It was never something to spread throughout the whole world until the coming of the Messiah. However, when the Messiah comes, this is from the Jewish perspective, God wanted the whole world to understand that this person who came was the Messiah and what it means that he's the Messiah. So God introduced Christianity as a way of, of uh, educating the whole world from their polytheism, from their paganism, to understanding about the one true God, to understanding of the moral um, uh, prescriptions of the Old Testament, and to be prepared for the coming of the Messiah so that when he comes, they'll recognize what happens, and all they'll have to say is, whoops, I guess we were wrong about Jesus, but this is the real guy. <laughs> so somehow the whole world had to be 
educated in Judaism without becoming Jews, so to speak. Is there is there any claim that this is anticipated by the prophets that there would be this several millennia of false, but no, I don't, Judaic not that I know. belief? Not that I know. Of. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Roy, you're speaking on a kind of evangelization in a sense, uh, as looked at through Judaism. That's that would be my next question, since. Uh, Judaism, in a, in one sense, it's it's a race, you know, the offspring of Jacob, but it's also a religion. Do those who are part of, uh, who are ethnically Jewish, do they do they wish for the Gentiles to come into Judaism as a religion, or is it more of something that we would like to keep within ourselves, like within the the family, so to speak? It's not. It's it's something. It's a third. It's a third thing, which is. What we know of, actually, as Christians, I mean, we have all we have the fullness of the truth, by the way, as Catholics, which makes it a lot easier to understand Judaism than it is for Jews to understand Judaism. Actually, that's one of the reasons I I wrote my book. Um, as Catholics, we understand that the purpose of Judaism was not for Judaism to propagate throughout all of humanity so that everyone on earth would be Jewish. The purpose of Judaism was to enable the coming of the Messiah. I mean, the whole purpose of Judaism was to enable the incarnation of Christ and to, to provide an infrastructure that could be the nucleus from which Christianity would spread. That was its purpose. It fulfilled that purpose. Otherwise, there wouldn't be two billion Christians in the world. So we understand that Judaism wasn't meant for all of humanity. It was meant to bring the Messiah who would then bring salvation to all of humanity. That is the teaching of Judaism within Judaism. You know, the Jews are to be a light to the Gentiles. They're to be a light to the nations. They're to be the source of the revelation of God to all of humanity, not through Judaism, but through the revelation of the Messiah. So, I mean, basically the Jews are right about that. They're just wrong about the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Why do you think there's such a, because I mean, I've been quite disturbed over the last few years by the kind of increase in weird conspiracy theorist sort of anti-Semitism in more conservative Catholic circles, um, which I found quite disturbing. Even people who seem to be quite sane and orthodox have started going off on this weird, uh, a very disturbing, unpleasant tangent. And I'm just wondering if you have any views on why this phenomenon has occurred, or, or am I mistaken about it? I, I, I don't know whether I'm just seeing things that were there already that I hadn't noticed before, or whether there's a genuine increase. No, you're not imagining it, and it's a source of great consternation to me. I, in some ways, am a traditional Catholic. I do, you know, I do like the, the Tridentine Mass. I you know, I, I, you know, I, I like the old style religion and so forth. Um, and it's very disturbing. And I probably know some of the um, otherwise very noble and, um, you know, virtuous Catholic spokespeople who have perhaps gone off that deep end. Uh, I can, I, 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 there's so many answers to why it's happening. One is, um, you know, you started the show by citing Vatican II. Yeah. Uh, Vatican II had a profound influence on the pract praxis of the Catholic Church, right? I, I know it's not dictated by Vatican II, but we now have the Novus Ordo Mass, not the Trinitine Mass. We now have a ecumenicism that had been condemned at times in the 19th century, Um you know, this is true. I mean, you know, we're talking, we're not talking about change in dogma necessarily, but we're talking about change in attitudes and change in practices and so forth. You know, all you have to do is, you know, look at late 19th century papal documents and see that many of the things that the church now uh, applauds were actually heavily frowned upon, to put it mildly. So what you have is you have a kind of, um, de facto, it's not really a schism in the church, but you have a de facto split between people whose hearts are with the kind of Catholicism that characterized the period up until the middle of the 20th century, 
and the kind of Catholicism that characterizes the last 60 or 70 years. I don't think I'm being controversial yet, am I? Um, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Go on. Okay. So, so what you have is, is you, you, you know, you do have this split. So you're talking about people who are on the um, pre-20th century side of that split or the pre-21st century side of the split. And one of the defenses they have against, um, against this uh, improper, in their view, improper watering down of the faith is they like to go back to pre-20th century theology and theologians. And in the 19th century in particular, uh, there was a tremendous amount of virulent anti-Semitism from traditional Catholic circles. I don't want to say for good reason, but he here's the situation in a nutshell. Um, until the 17th century, 18th century, let's say, until the 18th century, Europe was Christendom, right? It was the Holy Roman Empire. You couldn't be a king unless you were crowned by the Pope. Uh, the Catholic Church ruled supreme with minor exceptions. And what happened? You had these revolutionary movements all across Europe. You can think of the French Revolution. You can think of the Risorgimento that overthrew the Papal States. You can think of the German city-states that were that that uh, had revolutions that overthrew their theocratic governments and so forth. And most of those revolutions, the Jews were always on the side of the revolutions. Now, the reason they were always on the side of the revolutions was they had no emancipation. They had no civil rights under the Christian monarchs. Uh, by and large, true. Especially, well, I shouldn't say that, but for instance, in the Papal States, there were tremendous restrictions on where Jews could live, what they could wear. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't have any uh, fraternal relationships with the, uh, Christians and so forth. Um, in, the, in France, they had no civil rights until uh, the French Revolution granted them civil rights, so forth and so on. So, yeah, the Jews were part of the revolutionary force, so to speak, that overthrew uh, Christian rule, Christian monarchy, th Christian um, uh, theocracy. Same thing in Russia, right? The, the, the Tsar was the head of the Orthodox Church, and, and then you had the Bolshevik Revolution, and the Jews got emancipated in Russia, uh, but, but the church lost its standing and so forth. So the 19th century was kind of saturated in the fact that the Jews were destroying Christianity or destroying the Christian civil order. And these conservative Catholics like to go back to, um, or, or a lot of their reading is based in that stuff is one reason. Um, and a, a lot of their worldview is based in that, you know, the kind of oath against modernism and, and the, uh, there, there were serious uh, condemnations of secularism and in the existence of the secular state uh, coming from the church in the 19th century. And, and so these conservative Catholics tend to go back to that. And whenever, wherever they look, they see Jews as the revolutionary force or as part of the revolutionary force. And there was a lot of spurious anti-Semitism in those days also, like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which purported to uh, prove or give evidence that the Jewish revolutionary impulse, so to speak, was not simply one of emancipation, but was of world domination. So that's, I think, the virus that you see infecting these circles today. Yeah, that makes sense. Roy, if I could go back to, uh, on a similar vein, as Dr. Femister asked about how Jews would explain the explosion of Christianity in God's providence, uh, I would ask kind of a similar question on the interpretation of the book of Daniel. So as a, a Christian, it does look very clear, the 70 weeks of years, the four kingdoms, um, he's speaking to the Babylonian king, that there there is a very exact timing and there's a very exact uh, earthly kingdom in which the Messiah will come. You know, Rome, those 490 years past, I believe it's the temple of Zerubbabel, uh, correct me if I'm wrong there, uh, Roy, but it's it seems like that window has passed and of course, you know, Jesus comes, the word becomes incarnate in that window. So how do Jews today interpret the book of Daniel? Was it interpreted in one way before Christ and now it's interpreted differently? 
or is it is it more of uh, just not you know considering it as seriously or what would you say there Roy well uh, first let me ask you a question in all honesty if you had not heard the interpretation of that passage in Daniel and if you were simply looking at the text itself talking about, you know, after six weeks and then after seven weeks and then after 49 weeks and then after half a week, would you actually have come up with that interpretation? I, Roy, I probably would not. The 70 weeks of years probably would have been difficult. You know, it's, of course, it's impossible for me <laughs> to, yeah, exactly. to answer that question, so, you know, but uh, the, the kingdoms to me, that seems more easily digestible. Um, but go ahead, Roy. The what? I didn't catch that word. The, the what? The kingdoms. He's speaking. The yeah, the kingdoms that will come, and then the one that will be given over to God. Uh, well, th- isn't that also the prophecy that talks about about the uh, abomination of desolation sitting in the holy place? What's the interpretation that, of abomination of desolation sitting in the holy place? Tell me well, what that means. Isn't isn't that in the uh, isn't that in the the weeks prophecy? The the abomination of desolation. Of? I'm trying to remember that. And I wonder if it has something. My point, is, Go ahead. My, my, my point is really just that, first of all, I don't know. I don't know what the interpretation was uh, before Christianity. I'd certainly acknowledge that uh, an easier case is a virgin will, uh, the virgin will bear a son or they pierced my hands and my feet. And I do know that uh, Jewish theology after Christianity has studiously provided alternative uh, interpretations or even uh, textual variants to avoid the more direct prophecies that suggest Christianity is true. Uh, Whether this is one of those cases or not, I don't know. I don't know what the interpretation was before. I don't know what an interpretation is now. But um, I am sure that if they didn't have even if they did have the correct interpretation before the coming of Christ, um, in the last 2,000 years, they would have decided to have another interpretation instead. But the reason I was kind of a little bit combative there is because I actually think it's unfair to, um, to look at prophecies. See, prophecies after the fact become pretty transparent by what they mean. But before the fact... They are tremendously ambiguous and mysterious. Look at the book of Revelation. You know, is, 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 do any of the three of us understand the prophecies in the book of Revelation and how they'll actually come to fruition? Do you see what I mean? It's like, it's like before the fact, it's really hard to pin down these prophecies. Yeah. Thank you, Roy. It's I, interesting. Okay. Um, uh, the life of uh, Constantine the philosopher, it's from 9th century document. It's a, a life of, of, of St. Cyril, whose original baptismal name is Constantine, the, the, the apostle of the Slavs. And uh, it was written by an eyewitness, may have even been written by Methodius, his brother. Though it's certainly written by one of his disciples. And um, uh, in the early part of, of that text, it describes uh, St. Cyril visiting the Khazars in the Crimea, where he, uh, he, who were thinking of converting to Judaism, which they do ultimately do, I believe, and um, and and Constantine the philosopher Cyril is trying to convince them to convert to Christianity instead, and and they have a series of arguments which are recounted in this text, and uh, the the question of the kingdoms, the four kingdoms, comes up, and actually it's used against Christianity by the rabbis in this text because they say, well, you. Constantine are a Byzantine, or they use the term Byzantine, 19th century term, but but they, they you're a Roman, they say, and it's clear that when the Messiah comes, his kingdom will supersede the fourth kingdom, which everybody agrees is the kingdom of the Romans, and yet you're here, a Roman, so that proves that the Messiah hasn't come yet. So uh, uh, interestingly, that it's actually the same interpretation as Christians take of the four kingdoms is being taken by the rabbis in this story. In all, as an argument against the truth of Christianity. Of course, nowadays we think of the Roman Empire as being in the past, but in the Crimea in the ninth century, they didn't. They thought of it as something that was still very much in existence and centered on Constantinople. And Cyril has to, um, Cyril has to, his interpretation is that the Roman Empire ceased to exist in the fourth century when Constantine converted 
and was handed over to the messianic kingdom and became sort of became the messianic kingdom or became part of the messianic kingdom so i don't know i haven't made a great study of jewish interpretations of daniel uh chapter seven and nine, before right. the incarnation but but um but but at, at least at this time it seems to be interpreted at least as to the identity of the four kingdoms in the same way as the Christians did, it's just that the, the the fate of the Roman Empire was disputed between the Christians and the Jews. Yeah, and I think it, Josephus also might make a comment that, that Daniel predicted the times, not only the setting, but the times at which uh, the Messiah uh, would come. Uh, on a more the the actually, I, 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 I mean, a more accessible way of looking at that, at least for me, is that we know from the New Testament that the Jews knew that it was the time of the Messiah, right? Uh, that uh, when John the Baptist appeared, it's like, uh, there's a passage there, right? That that everyone was questioning, is he the Messiah? Because they knew this was the time that the Messiah was supposed to appear. Uh, Roy, I have maybe a, a more personal question. Uh, I'm, I have in mind someone else who had a, a very mystical experience, uh, and I won't rule on the authenticity of, of this particular person's experience. It's Gloria Polo. She's hit by lightning in the in the 90s, and she has this experience of judgment, and she comes back to life. And uh, she speaks about how she felt like having that experience, she now had a great responsibility to go out. And for her, that would be a form of evangelization that she had received. She had seen you know, so much that the Lord was now calling her to, to go out as a very a zealous um, and brazen kind of evangelist of the truth. So, uh, Roy, if, if you're willing to speak to this, from these mystical experiences, do you feel, kind of as Jesus says, to him who's been given much, of him much will be required, do you feel that there's a, a commission a tied to it as well, or, or your thoughts there, Roy? I, I, I feel very strongly that the reason why I was given these uh, special gifts or uh, events or whatever you want to call them was um, because I was supposed to work for the evangelization of the Jews. Um, I, I knew that from the outset. Uh, I, I didn't know that from the outset. I didn't know what that meant. It took me 20 years before I was able to put the you know rubber on the road and actually make any you know headway in doing anything but in any case um i think it was all about the evangelization of the jews we know that the second coming can't happen until there's a widespread conversion of the jews paragraph 674 of the new catechism of the catholic church quote the glorious messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by the jews that's from Romans 11, but it's actually doctrine in the catechism. And I do think that, uh, I, I don't have a timeline, but I do think that the Lord was very interested in uh, getting a little more activity underway, uh, working towards the evangelization, or towards the conversion of the Jews. Um, I didn't know what that meant because uh, I, you know, surprisingly, don't get invited to, by rabbis to speak at their synagogues, right? <laughs> I only get invited by Catholic pastors to speak at their churches. But what I've discovered is that um, that a lot of Catholics have a heart for uh, the conversion of the Jews, have a heart for the Jews, uh, want to pray for the conversion of the Jews. There are probably hundreds come up to me and said, Oh, thank goodness, because I've always wanted to pray for the conversion of the Jews. But until you came along, I thought I wasn't allowed to. I thought we weren't allowed to anymore. And so I think that um, my my particular ministry is a kind of indirect way of working for the conversion of the Jews, of encouraging Catholics to pray for the conversion of the Jews, to understand the importance of praying for the conversion of the Jews, um, and for uh, to understand the importance and the God-pleasingness of evangelizing Jewish, you know, friends and doctors and and uh, relatives when circumstances invite them to. So that's the answer is yeah, I do, I do think, uh, and and uh, I I think I have a particular little tiny slice of the evangelization pie that's oriented towards that. Thank you, Roy, Doctor uh, Fimister. Uh, a final question. 
if um i often you know find myself in ubers from one one time or another and uh, uh if i'm not too exhausted i i try and use it as an opportunity to strike up a conversation with the uber driver and and sometimes you know bring them a little bit closer to the faith and i i don't think i don't think i've ever had a jewish uber driver but um they've had many very interesting conversations in that context and i just wonder if one were in that sort of situation where one happened to end up in a conversation with a with a jewish person either um secular or observant in some respect what would be the best approach to trying to share to some degree uh some element of the faith without just alienating or offending the person one was talking to um first of all i again i probably have three answers to that the first is um a pray for guidance from the holy spirit because there's no one size fits all answer yeah. um i think that the generally and you know usually i speak to parishes usually i don't speak to world-class theologians and church historians like the present company um but so when i'm speaking to you know a kind of a, an ordinary parish audience the uh angle of evangelization that i strongly uh you know uh propose is simply to let the jewish person know what your faith means to you what your relationship to god is now i don't think that's entirely the same situation uh, you're describing professor but you know when an ordinary person goes to work let's say and has a jewish co-worker and uh, if that if that ordinary catholic can simply say why going to mass isn't a chore but it's their greatest joy of their day you know why they get so much comfort from their relationship with the blessed virgin mary why the eucharist means so much to them um why for that matter they have this sense of divine providence so even if they get terrible news they uh, don't think it's just because bad things happen it's because it's part of god's plan somehow if you can simply share your perspective of the world and your relationship with god with jews they will know you have something that they don't have even if they don't admit it and it will make them jealous and saint paul says in romans 11 i don't have it in front of me he says salvation has come to the gentiles so as to make the jews jealous that is the jealousy of the jews for what the gentiles have in the church which will bring about their conversion that's in romans 11 somewhere around probably verse 15 or 12 or something thank you your case may be a little bit different because um for instance when i my case is different too you, one of the hurdles i have to get over with speaking with a jew is it's not why roy did you decide to become a catholic why did you decide to go over to the enemy the question is who was jesus and was jesus the jewish messiah so the first step is to have them focus on the question is who is jesus not who are you because the normal jewish response is you know that's fine for you you're a catholic but i'm jewish so it's got nothing to do with me it's not about you it's about who jesus was and by the way if i can get a little bit on pc now that is the terrible 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 i think sin of of the uh interfaith movement of this ecumenical you know i'm okay you're okay <laughs> you know we all have to respect each other we do have to respect each other as individuals but if the catholic church is true then contemporary judaism is wrong because the underlying issue is who is Jesus. And if Judaism is right, contemporary Judaism is right, then the Catholic Church is wrong, because the underlying question is who is Jesus. And Jesus either was the Jewish Messiah or he wasn't. He either was the Son of God or he isn't. So if the rules of not giving offense are such that you can't address the elephant in the room, then, then it's doing a terrible disservice. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was thinking a bit about what you said earlier, I mean, about uh, the, the roots of, of resurgent anti-Semitism among conservative Catholics at the moment. I mean, I, it seems to me that 
there was a really important examination of conscience that had to take place after World War II. I mean, something so appalling can't happen without going over what you've done for hundreds and hundreds of years and thinking, well, uh, am I in any way responsible? Is my is the church and Catholics anyway in any way responsible for what's happened? And that seems to me, obviously, that was vastly, massively important and necessary. And that seems to have been, as the evil one always does, misused to try and generate a, a, a phobia of sharing the gospel, you know, which in a way is an even greater crime. Well, not I, I don't know. How, perhaps that's too dangerous to say, but but is 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 also a terrible crime to deny uh, the truth of the gospel to uh, Christ's own people uh, as a supposed um, uh, apology for for having failed to protect them from this horrendous abomination in in the 1940s i agree completely i i, I rosalind moss uh, who started a religious order she's now mother miriam of the lamb of god said there there's no more there's no nothing that's more anti-semitic than refusing to share the gospel with jews i mean depriving them of their own messiah I mean, I agree with you, and I agree with you, of course, everything you said, including the fact that um, this is an outgrowth of the, let's say, sins of omission, perhaps, of many Catholics and even of institutions within the Catholic Church, um, uh, you know, that, that kind of um, uh, gave fertile ground to anti-Semitism, and there's a, a, rec- a needed recognition for that and so forth. But um, it is, it is um, you know, doubling the offense if the result of that is that you turn your back on even praying for the conversion of the Jews, which, you know, does not really offend them very much. They're usually not at Good Friday services, you know. He said, here's the <laughs> prayer for the conversion of the Jews. By the way, um, the uh, just as a little factoid, I, I don't want to, you know, put, uh, you know, fuel on the gasoline on the fire. Uh, the the uh, Vatican newspaper of the 1930s, Civilta Catholica, mm-hmm. uh, in, as late as 1932, and I believe 1933, published articles confirming the blood libel that Jews needed the blood of Christian children to make their Passover matzahs. I this know, is yeah, that's terrible. News in the 1930s. Gosh. So there certainly were... Um, uh, I don't know how to put it, but unfortunate um, fueling of anti-Semitism by organs of the Catholic Church uh, into, basically into the times that led up to the Holocaust. By the way, it was Pius XI, um, Pius XI called in the editor of Civil Catholica into his office when that last article appeared. And he said, um, if, if this ever appears, anything like this ever appears again, you're no longer the editor. So he <laughs> yeah. put the kibosh on that. But that was the early 30s already. Um, well, Roy, I'm, I'm watching the clock here, but uh, I would like to ask, do you have final thoughts for our listeners, whether that's evangelization or that's resources or that's just something to consider? Um, what would you like to, to say? <laughs> final thought. Um, my final thoughts. Let's see. It's all true. I mean, the real Catholic faith is all true. And um, if you're born Catholic or if you're converted Catholic, you are, you know, you've been given the greatest gift that God ever gave to any human being. And um, you should appreciate it. And you should share the wealth because you're going to die sooner or later. And you're going to wish at that point that you had shared it as much as you could. God, that's great. Um, thanks again, Roy, for your witness uh, to God's call into the new and living covenant and in the manner he describes in John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And so we praise God for drawing, choosing you, and for the witness that that has provided for thousands of who have encountered your story, whether written or spoken. And this is Think Catholic. My name is Austin Habish with Dr. Alan Fimister and special guest, Professor Roy Shulman. And thanks again for joining us.